This paper came out of two years of travel and research from 1986 through 1988 that started with a sabbatical year as a national fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution and then ended with a year as a Fulbright Senior Research Fellow at the Hungarian Central Statistical Office in Budapest. The idea for the research actually came up during a research visit at the West German Federal Population Research Institute in 1984, where I found several of the West German demographers deeply concerned with a newly discovered problem. At this point, East and West Germany were still separate countries. They had noticed that death rates among middle-aged people, especially men, had started to increase in some of the neighboring Eastern European countries. This is not what death rates are supposed to do. Death rates decrease, and once they have fallen, they remain low. The fact that this was happening close to their borders made the German demographers worry that perhaps they were next. Were adult death rates about to start increasing in West Germany too, as they were doing in East Germany? When I got back to the United States, these concerns of the German demographers began to rub off on me. When my first sabbatical year came along a couple of years later, I resolved to get to a research institute somewhere and really concentrate on this issue for the whole year. My former advisor from graduate school, Kingsley Davis, was working at the Hoover Institution at Stanford at that point, so I managed to get one of their national fellowships for the sabbatical year. In addition to starting this research, I used that year in Palo Alto to submit my application for the Fulbright program, and this gave me a second year to continue the work in Budapest. I've taken for granted for many generations now that they are on the leading edge of all kinds of demographic trends. The oldest of these trends, of course, is the initial mortality decline that heralds the onset of the demographic transition. And it is true that the demographic transition did appear first in northwestern Europe. Then, after nearly a century, it began to spread into southeastern Europe, and only later has been making its appearance in other parts of the world. <clears throat> the only exceptions to this European frontier for the demographic transition were other countries, such as Australia, Canada, or the United States, that had been heavily settled by migrants from northwestern Europe, plus, of course, the special case of Japan that we have already heard so much about. Fertility decline, the other half of the transition, also came along in these same European regions somewhat later, but still ahead of its appearance in other parts of the world. Europeans truly have been the demographic pioneers of the last couple of centuries. And a seemingly rock-solid assumption in the theory of the demographic transition from the very beginning has been that once death rates fall to modern low levels, they then stay there. Whether they are caused by urbanization or by the scale of modern industrial production or by capitalism or by the luxuries of better public health policies and medical discoveries, low death rates are an irreversible part of the transition. So you might imagine the alarm it caused when European demographers got their first look at the annual updates to vital statistics reports of births and deaths for the various countries on the continent and there are a lot of little countries jammed together on the European continent, and discovered to their surprise and horror that in some of these countries, death rates had started rising again instead of falling and remaining at a comfortable low level. The poster child for this pattern of rising working age mortality was Hungary, right in the geographic center of the European continent. Of course, an isolated spike in death rates is not unheard of and has happened before. For example, we are still looking back at the terrible epidemic of Spanish influenza that swept around the entire world in 1918, killing hundreds of millions of people, especially young adults. A sudden spasm of mortality only lasted for a period of some months, and then disappeared again as quickly as it had erupted out of nowhere. Wartime casualties can eliminate large numbers of military-age men from the populations of particularly hard-hit countries, in addition to causing low birth rates while couples are separated by military service. But in all these cases, the long-term demographic impact of such sudden acute spells of high death rates is virtually zero, and populations keep on with their progress towards low birth and death rates after the epidemics or other disasters pass. In Eastern Europe, it was a different story. If those other episodes of higher death rates might be called waves, in this case, it was more like a tide that was coming in. 
The increase in death rates was not sudden and dramatic, but crept upward year after year like a tide washing against the shores of a population. And like a tide, eventually it began to erode that population. Overall life expectancy in the country also stopped increasing and then began to slide backwards towards younger average ages at death. No wonder the German demographers were concerned when they saw this happening just across the border in some of their neighbors to the east. What would we think in the United States if death rates in Canada began to creep upward year after year? Like any good detective, I started my search for clues by once again rounding up the usual suspects. The old joke about demographers is that we never die. We are just broken down by age and sex. And the first step in tackling almost any demographic research problem is the same. It generally helps when things are broken down by age and sex. So my first task was to find out the age pattern of the mortality problem. This first step was the easiest because every respectable government maintains reliable systems of registering vital events and publishes detailed annual statistical results describing the pattern of these events. Without good vital statistics, there could be no life insurance industry. Schools would never know how many students to expect next year. In fact, one of the basic signs that you are a modern, developed country is that you can show us your reliable vital statistics for your population. So during my research years at Stanford and then in Budapest, since this was before the heyday of laptop computers and there was no internet, I poured through massive volumes of published mortality statistics and compiled age-specific schedules of death rates for year after year, starting at the end of World War II and gradually marching forward over the next 30 years. Within only a decade after the communists came to power in the post-war period, adult death rates stopped falling. The bottom of mortality decline in this respect was about 1955. If we plot death rates for each age group with 1955 as a standard baseline, we can divide each year's death rate at any age by the death rate in some other year at that same age. For 1955 itself, of course, this ratio is always 1.0, and 1955 will appear as a horizontal line across all age groups at this value of 1.0 on the chart. If death rates are falling over time, this ratio to the 1955 rate will produce values below 1, dropping below the 1955 line. If death rates are rising over time instead, this ratio to the 1955 rate will produce values above 1, rising above the 1955 line. Using this approach, it is easy to see what was happening. Death rates for children and teenagers continued to fall during the communist period in the country. The curves for later years all dip lower and lower below the horizontal reference year of 1950 at these young ages. The same thing can be seen at old ages. There also, continued mortality decline bends the rates for later years below the 1955 starting point. This is in sharp contrast, though, to what happens at the heart of the working ages, particularly at ages between 35 and 45, when people are supposed to be rising toward the peaks of their careers, the tide of rising death rates of Hungarian men was coming in. In 1965, this trend was barely noticeable, but it was there. 1965 death rates at these ages were slightly higher than they had been a few years earlier. By 1975, the verdict was clear for all to see. The middle-age mortality bulge had become truly alarming. By 1985, it had risen even higher, high enough to actually reduce overall life expectancy in the country. Almost unbelievably, the details of published age-specific death rates a few years later even indicated that by 1995, the risk of death for a Hungarian man in his early 40s was about two and a half times higher than it had been a generation earlier. Nothing like this steady 30-year rise in death rates year after year had ever been seen anywhere on earth before. At the time, sitting in the library of the statistical office in Budapest, I was nearly 40 years old myself, and it actually made me a little nervous to find myself living in the country. Whatever explanation there might be for the rising tide of deaths in middle age in Hungary, it would have to be consistent with this age pattern in the rates. It could not be an explanation that applied to children or old people. It would have to be something affecting people in the heart of the working ages. The first piece of the puzzle was in place. that All of the increase in Hungarian mortality happened in the working ages, 
and that both little children and old people were completely immune to the phenomenon, the next usual suspect in demographic detective work is sex. The alarming rise in death rates from 1955 to 1995, documented in the previous chart, occurred for Hungarian men. If we draw another chart with exactly the same ages and calendar years, and with the same vertical scale for ratios between death rates in later years and the starting point in 1955, but based on recorded deaths for Hungarian women instead, we immediately see a major difference. It is true that there are similarities in the separate charts by sex. For example, in both charts, the mortality rate curves are trending downward after 1955 for the younger childhood ages and at the oldest ages. This is true for women just as it was for men. The contrast between the two charts, however, appears in the working ages. Women show almost no sign of the huge increases over time in risks of death that we observed for men. It is important to say almost here because even Hungarian women revealed some slight increases in death rates at the heart of the working ages in this period. It is virtually unheard of to find increases in death rates for women at any age in any population in the world during the 20th century. So even a standstill in death rates for middle-aged women, let alone an actual increase, however slight it might have been, should be like a canary in the coal mine, a clear indication that something was going desperately wrong in post-war Hungary. This should not distract us from the more important fact, though, that except for a very small uptick in death rates, women of all ages were basically immune from the huge jump in working age mortality seen for men. Once we have zeroed in on clear concentrations of the mortality increase by both age and sex, we have to look around for another dimension of social differences that might help us to triangulate on where the death rates were rising. This kind of sharpening focus eventually should give us some good hints about what actually might be causing the increase. In the United States, we would probably turn next to dividing up the population by race and ethnic identities and checking to see how different the death rates might be for middle-aged men across these categories. The population of Hungary, however, did not display this kind of ethnic diversity in the mid-20th century. All those little countries in Europe have spent a lot of their histories sorting themselves out by ethnicity so that nearly all the people in Hungary are just Hungarians, nearly all the people in Greece are just Greeks, and nearly all the people in Ireland are simply Irish. So we need a different kind of dividing line to try to isolate another dimension of the mortality increase. Communist rulers of post-war Hungary made a big deal out of announcing that they were getting rid of the old class distinctions between capitalists and workers, and that in fact their goal was nothing less than creating a new society centered on the proletariat or working class as the ruling group. Marx and Lenin, the leading prophets of the communist religion, called it the dictatorship of the proletariat. The idea was to eliminate the exploitation of workers by rich factory owners and bankers, to create universal education for all, to make health care free and equal for all citizens, and to guarantee that everyone had the same opportunity to find adequate housing and other amenities. Their strategy for achieving the socialist paradise was to take over all private businesses previously owned and run by capitalists and make them state-owned and operated. Every bakery, laundromat, taxicab service, restaurant, hotel, grocery store, and school belonged to the government, and everybody who worked in them was a government employee. The government set all prices, set all wages, and guaranteed that everyone would have a job when they finished the state-run schools. In fact, it was technically illegal to be unemployed because there was no excuse not to have a job. Since the Hungarian leaders made such a point about getting rid of all the former inequalities between owners and workers, I thought it would be interesting to test a hypothesis that they had in fact managed to do this, and that there were no differences in risks of death based on people's occupations any longer. Research in England, the United States, and other developed countries on the capitalist side of the ledger already had established that there were clear occupational differences in risks of death for men in the working ages. Men who worked in less skilled jobs, particularly the kind of industrial manufacturing and transport occupations that are sometimes called blue-collar jobs, had higher death rates than men working in white-collar office and professional occupations.
a lively debate was going on about precisely why this might be true. Some people thought it might be because the jobs themselves posed different kinds of risks, while others thought that it involved different attitudes and lifestyles, which themselves might trace all the way back to differences in education for the occupational groups. But if the communists had really created their worker state, empowering the blue-collar working class, erasing differential access to education and other life chances, then there should be no such occupational contrasts in death rates for the Hungarian men. It took more than half of my year in Budapest just to chase down the data to test this hypothesis. Some Hungarian demographers were convinced that I would find that there were no differences by occupation and that I was wasting my time. Others were not so sure, but it was difficult to find the data needed because of a problem in Hungarian mortality statistics. To calculate death rates by occupation, the first thing you need is death certificates for the numerator of the rate, which lists occupations of the people who have died. The second thing you need is census counts of people, again with occupations as one of the pieces of information recorded for each of them. For men still working in their occupations at the time they die, both of these items are available. The problem comes in because the published mortality data for Hungary did not then include occupations for anyone who was not actually working in the labor force. In general, this created a problem for studying occupational differences in death rates of older people because they were listed as retired instead of recording the occupations they had once pursued. But there was another aspect of this exception to recording occupations that created a real threat to finding reliable results. All state-owned firms were responsible for the health of their employees. There were medical dispensaries on site in factories and other businesses staffed with government health workers. Annual records collected on the performance of each firm and how healthy they were keeping their employees. So naturally, no factory manager or manager of a collective farm or a state-run department store wanted to see any employees dying on the job. For example, if somebody survived a heart attack on the job in any Hungarian business, this gave a loud and clear warning bell to the management that this person might eventually suffer another attack, which might end in a death that would be counted against the business at the end of the year. So anytime any worker had a heart attack or any other serious symptom of a possible death later on, that worker was usually kicked out of the factory or other workplace and sent home on a disability pension. 80% of all survivors of heart attacks in Hungary were immediately pensioned off with a disability, and only 20% were given any help with rehabilitation to get them back on the job. By comparison, in the United States at this time, these percentages were exactly reversed. 20% of U.S. heart attack survivors went on disability pensions, and 80% went back to work with rehabilitation assistance. The unintended result of policies like this was that the share of men in the working ages in Hungary who were pensioned off with disabilities instead of working rose extremely rapidly year after year. The growing fraction of disability pensioners among working-aged men posed an obvious threat to my research design. Since they were retired, if they died, no occupation was given for them in the official published death statistics. They were included as a separate group outside the labor force. And these were precisely the people who were most likely to be dying, contributing to the rising death rates for working age men. In fact, if we look only at death rates for the men who were still employed, we find that their death rates were actually falling, while the rates for the whole population of men were rising. This is sometimes called the healthy worker effect, a classic problem for mortality scholars. Somehow we had to find the previous occupations for all those men on disability pensions and factor that into calculating the rates. This is what took over half a year. We finally found a stack of dusty old computer printouts in an obscure back room inside the statistical office, and these actually showed previous occupations as well as current occupations for men who had died. The information had been collected on death certificates after all. It just had not been transferred to the published records in the official annual reports of mortality. Once I had the occupations for both employed workers and disability pensioners, I could combine the two groups and calculate death rates by year for everyone who had the same occupation, either currently or in the past.
The stage was set to test whether the communists had really eliminated differences in mortality for different occupations. Mortality records were combined for Hungarian men, including both those still working in their occupations and those who had been pensioned off from them. It did not take long to calculate death rates for two contrasting groups of workers. On one side were all the blue-collar occupations, including factory workers, transport drivers, and all other occupations that involved any kind of physical labor, what the Hungarians called physikai, or manual occupations. On the other side were all the white-collar occupations, including accountants, lawyers, doctors, engineers, plant managers, and all other occupations that the Hungarians called selami, or mental occupations. In communist jargon, these were sometimes referred to as workers of the chair. I sorted these two groups out into age groups and calculated their death rates year by year over the course of the three decades that death rates had been rising for men in general. Even after I returned home from Hungary, I kept track of all these statistics for another 10 years as well to get a more complete picture of the communist period. See that in 1960, the mortality differences were actually pretty small between these occupational sectors. There was a small tendency for blue-collar workers to have higher death rates in their 30s, but for men in their 20s or their 40s on either side of this middle range, death rates indeed were almost the same for both groups of occupations. But by 1970, it was a different story. The excess mortality of the manual or blue-collar workers remained noticeably for men in their 30s, but also jumped up for men in their 40s and 50s, and also for younger men under 30. By 1980, blue-collar workers had death rates that were double the rates of white-collar workers in several age groups. By 1984, the last year for which I could find these data in 1987 and 1988 when I was there, almost all age groups had blue-collar death rates more than double the rates for white-collar employees and for men in their 30s, this risk of death was almost three times as high in the manual occupations. In fact, if we compare the death rates for each of these occupational halves of the labor force across the years observed, we see virtually no change over time among the white-collar or mental workers. Only the manual blue-collar workers show increases in death rates from year to year. The white-collar workers appeared to be immune to whatever the problem might be. When I showed these results to colleagues in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, they frankly didn't believe them. We are suffering just as much as the physical workers, they insisted. It was not that they didn't believe that death rates were rising so dramatically for the physical workers. Everybody knew that. They just believed that I should have found the same dysfunctional increases in mortality among the mental workers like them. They felt just as sorry for themselves living in a communist society as did anybody else. But it wasn't true. They, they were immune to the phenomenon. One more little nagging doubt, however, still remained before I could really believe these results. One of the problems of studying occupations as categories is that over a period of 20 or 30 years, people's occupations can change. Of course, age changes too, but in a predictable, unavoidable way that poses no challenges to analysis. But what if men were moving between the manual and non-manual occupation groups over time? For example, if the healthiest manual workers were also the ones most likely to move ahead and shift over into management or other white-collar jobs, they might be leaving behind a group of more unhealthy co-workers. This kind of selection effect could be moving men across the occupational boundary, but leaving most of the deaths behind in the blue-collar jobs. A couple of careful calculations, however, show that even if something like this had been going on, it only would have accounted for a tiny fraction of the huge increase in blue-collar death rates and would not explain at all why this increase was absent for the white-collar jobs. The risk of death really was rising very rapidly for the average blue-collar worker, but not for the average white-collar worker. Why? Why did death rates increase only in blue-collar occupations? This additional piece of the puzzle now was in place along with the other pieces that linked rising mortality to only certain age groups and to only men. This article then adds one more puzzle piece, which perhaps turned out to be more revealing than any of the others, at least once they'd already been discovered. 
Along with information about age, sex, and occupations, death certificates in Hungary and pretty much everywhere else also include codes for causes of death. Exactly how did each person die? Were they murdered or did they die in a car crash or have a heart attack? And it turns out that when you sort out the deaths to the working age men with blue collar occupations, another clear pattern emerges for causes of death. The causes that increased the fastest over time for these men included deaths from cirrhosis of the liver, very strongly linked to long-term alcohol abuse, from bronchitis, emphysema, and asthma, very strongly linked to smoking, from heart disease, also linked to smoking and diet, and from suicides. In fact, when I was leaving Budapest at the end of my year in Hungary, a man actually jumped in front of my train and was killed delaying the train for some time and causing a sensation among the passengers, including myself. What do all of these causes of death have in common? Why would they concentrate particularly among only the middle-aged blue-collar men? At the time, nearly 30 years ago, I could only speculate about some of the possible explanations that might be consistent with all of these puzzle pieces. Deficient health care, for example, probably is not a good candidate, because such deficiencies should affect mainly children and old people, not workers in the prime of life. Linking the rising death rates to smoking and drinking gives at least a behavioral explanation, but why should these self-destructive behaviors, as well as suicide, be so concentrated only among men, and only among men with blue-collar jobs at that? Why not women with white-collar jobs? After all, most women as well as men had occupational identities in Hungary under the communists, I simply didn't have the whole story 30 years ago when this article appeared. Since that time, I've developed a strong suspicion about what was causing these rising death rates to focus on certain age groups, on only men in blue-collar occupations, and on only certain causes of death. During the radical communist transformation of the society, Hungarian leaders engineered a massive shift of the labor force out of rural agricultural work and into urban blue-collar factory jobs. The small rural farming villages were consolidated into huge mechanized collective farms, and the men who previously had worked in the fields found themselves underemployed and encouraged by the government to move to town and work in factories. There they lived in huge anonymous apartment towers with very few consumer goods and services, very few family contacts, and none of the social controls of everyday rural village life. Virtually all of these displaced rural workers went into blue-collar, not white-collar jobs. I now suspect that it was these migrants from the farms to the factories who were left behind by the government, neglected and isolated, and left to develop destructive habits of smoking, drinking, and otherwise destroying themselves. Sometimes it happened slowly, as in deaths from cirrhosis or emphysema. Sometimes it happened suddenly, as in the case of suicide. But there may be an important lesson for all societies here in the case of communist Hungary. It is possible for systematic social changes not only to lower birth and death rates, at least in the case of death rates, to cause them to rise instead. It is particularly important to add the postscript that today, nearly 20 years after the communist experiment collapsed of its own dead weight in Eastern Europe, the death rates of working-age blue-collar men in the country have returned to their older and more comfortable habit of falling again, instead of rising as they did for nearly half a century of state socialist control.